Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know that we're coming toward the end of the church year, right? So the calendar year goes from January 1st through the next year, but the church year begins in <coughs> Advent. I heard it. That's good. <laughs> That's right. And so we have today and next Sunday and then Christ the King Sunday, two weeks from now, and then we'll, after that we'll go into Advent. So I have really enjoyed this past year being able to preach from so many passages out of the Gospel of Matthew, which was the predominant Gospel that we looked at this year. Next year we'll start and we'll look at the Gospel of Mark. And so especially at the end of the church year, we are usually looking at passages having to do with the end of time, or with the final judgment, or with the resurrection. And so it is today. Today's lesson has to do with the ten virgins and the return of the bridegroom. Next week's gospel lesson is going to have to do with the parable of the talents. Do you remember the one who had ten talents and made ten more? Another had five talents and made five more. And a third one who buried his talent and had nothing more when his master came back. And then Christ the King Sunday, of course, is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And Matt, so all of these come out of Matthew chapter 25. So I really look forward to talking about these passages, these three Sundays, on the end of time, on the final judgment. But as I get into it, I'm afraid I do have a very difficult word for you about it. You need to hear it. Maybe to help you just understand this a little bit, let me ask you a question. How many of you have dreams? I'm talking about the kind of dreams you have at night while you're asleep. Let me see your hands if you have dreams. Most of you. There's a couple exceptions, but most of you do. How many of you remember some of your dreams or parts of your dreams? Okay, most of you. Now, how many of you have ever had a dream where somebody or something was chasing you? Let's see. All right, just about everybody. When I did a little research on this, actually, they said that that's almost universal. Just about everybody has had dreams where they feel like they're being chased. I, one of the reasons I thought of it is because I had a dream like that this week. I, there were a whole bunch of people looking for me in this giant house, and I was moving to different places. And finally, I went outside the house, and they saw me, and there was a lake. And so I thought, well, the only way I can get away from them is to start swimming across the lake. And I'm swimming, and I'm looking to see if they can get around the outside of the lake to the other side before I can swim across. And I don't know if I'm going to make it, and I'm swimming, and I'm swimming, and boom, I wake up. <laughs> and have you ever had that happen? You wake up, and you're in this, you're in this panic, right? Well, the reason I asked you is because I uh, wanted you to think for just a second of what that feeling was like. What did you feel in that dream when you were being chased? That sense of fear, maybe panic, that something is after you? Are you going to be able to get away from it? And I want you to hold on to that feeling for just a moment. We're going to come back to it because it is a very valuable thing to have as we look at these texts today. Because as I said, I do have kind of a difficult word for you. And I hope you want that, right? If you have a pastor that never tells you anything but sweetness and light and everything is great and everything is wonderful, that pastor's a liar. Don't listen to him. You want the pastor that will say the truth, even if there are warnings involved in that, right? When you go to the mechanic, nobody likes to hear this. But if the mechanic says, well, the Fratistat is messed up and it's going to cost you $800 to get a new one, nobody likes to hear that. But if it's true, you sure hope he tells you before you get back on the road, right? Or if you go to the doctor. And the doctor says, well, your glockenspiel is kaput. We're going to have to do surgery. 
You don't want to hear that, but you'd sure rather hear that if it's true than to not have it told to you. And so it is with the scripture, brothers and sisters. When there are warnings in scripture, we, we need to hear them, don't we? How do most people, I'm talking not about Christians or strong Christians per se, but popularly, just kind of out there. How do most people think someone gets to heaven? The answer is by dying. You get to heaven by dying. In other words, if you listen to people talk and you listen to popular opinion, most people that have even any conception of a, a cosmology where there is such a thing as a heaven, they seem to think that everybody goes there. Oh, there might be some really, really terrible people that don't go. But for the most part, everybody goes. And so you go to a lot of funerals, and you sometimes hear the worst nonsense at funerals, don't you? You know, somebody that maybe wasn't even baptized, certainly didn't live out their baptism, never set foot in the church before, didn't confess Christ, didn't show any evidence of being a Christian. And you'll hear this stuff about, well, now he's got his wings, and he's with the angels, and it's designed to comfort everybody, make everyone feel better. But it's this common idea that when you die, you go to heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that heaven is for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. And so the texts today, in fact the gospel texts for the next couple Sundays, I think are giving us a warning against that kind of thing. For example, in the text that Nadine read for us from the book of Amos, Amos warns the people, he says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment, the day God comes back, the day everything ends. Woe to you who desire that, who think it's going to be a great thing, because it's darkness and not light. And he says it's as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Remember the chasing dream? You're being chased by a lion. It's catching up on you. It's going to get you. And finally, you turn the corner where you're going to be safe, and there's a bear. <laughs> or he says it's like a man who went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and the serpent bit him. You remember the chasing dream? Something's after you. It's coming. You're scared. You're running. And finally, you reach the house, and you go in, and you shut the door, and you're safe. And there's a poisonous snake up around the post there, and it bites you. He said, that's what the day of the Lord is going to be like for many people. They think that by dying, they're going to be in heaven. And the truth of the matter is they're in for a terrible surprise. This is primal, isn't it? This is the stuff horror movies are made out of, right? You watch these horror movies, these scary movies, and something's after somebody, and right when they think they're safe, something else gets them or something. Isn't that the, the plot for most of these movies? It's primal. It gets to us. We realize that that is something fearsome. And Amos is calling attention to that. A lot of people read this passage in Amos, and they see it as though it's people in covenant relationship with God who just aren't letting justice roll down like waters. They're not showing social justice. They need to be more concerned about the poor and about other people. If you would read a little further past where our text was today, you would discover that this is talking about people who are engaged in abject idolatry. They are worshiping false gods. And so God is telling them, you're not my covenant people. When the day of judgment comes for you, it's going to be a day of darkness and a day of gloom. It's not good news for them. And so it is also for our gospel lesson today. We read about the ten virgins. Five of them are foolish and five are wise. So five get into the banquet feast. But for the other five, the door is shut. Next week we'll read about this, the parable of the talents. And we read that one multiplied is ten talents, one multiplied is five talents, but the other one who buried his talent is cast into darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Two weeks from now, the parable of the sheep and the goats. We'll see how the king comes and divides the sheep and the goats, and some will enter into the joy of the Lord, but others will be cast into the place created for the devil and his angels. There's a warning in all of this. Now, you know, our initial reaction to these texts, I think, is to focus then upon the things on which these uh, decisions turn, right? So the five foolish virgins don't get in because they didn't have enough oil. So I think a lot of times this text gets preached as though, do you have enough oil in your lamp? Do you have, are you prepared for when the master comes? Or the text on the uh, talents is often preached then, as though if you're burying your talent and you're not using it for the Lord, then you, then you need to be doing that so that when the master comes, he's pleased with you. Or the parable of the sheep and the goats. Do you remember? The goats are cast into the dark place because they didn't welcome the stranger and they didn't feed the hungry and they didn't uh, visit those who were in prison. And so uh, the preaching on these texts, it would, it would be very tempting to focus on those things. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that would preach. That would preach. Oh, boy, I could make you feel really guilty up here today. Do you have enough oil in your lamp? Have you been coming to church and getting enough of the word of God so that if the bridegroom were to come back today, you would have what it takes? Or have you been sloughing off? Have you been using your talents for the Lord? Or have you been burying your talents? Have you been visiting those in prison and feeding the hungry and caring for the poor and welcoming the stranger? Or have you not been doing those things? Oh, that really preaches. And some of you, I could preach that way, and you'd be all busy working in the church because you'd be feeling so guilty. And the rest of you would leave and never come back to church again because you don't want to hear it anymore, right? Besides the fact that that kind of preaching is strictly law, I don't think I can preach it that way because I don't think that is the main thrust of this text. Oh, to be sure... There seems to be a secondary emphasis like that. It's hard to preach these and not point that out in some way. But I don't think that is the main thrust of it. I have three reasons why I don't think that is. One has to do with the parable of the sheep and the goats. It's a, it's a passage with which I have spent much time in, the, in recent years, partly because so many people preach it poorly. Because so many people interpret that or understand that as being salvation by works. Some people are sheep and they go to heaven because they have fed the hungry and clothed the naked. And other people are cast into hell because they didn't feed the hungry and clothed the naked. That is contrary to the scripture and it's got to be contrary to that passage. And so as you study that passage very carefully, I think you discover that that is not the thrust of that text. And so that's not what these passages are driving at, trying to get you to change what you do, per se. A second reason, I think, has to do with our gospel text for today. If those who are prepared to enter heaven are those who have enough oil, and those who are not prepared to go to heaven are those who do not have enough oil, then you have to ask the question, well, what's the oil? And it's fascinating, the answers you get to this, right? As I listened to other sermons about it and read various commentaries about it, I saw all kinds of people come up with answers to this. So one says the oil is the presence of God in your life. Another says it's spiritual preparation. Another says it's desire for eternal life. Another says it's wisdom. Another says it's undivided focus upon the Lord. Another one says it's knowledge of God's word and obedience to God's word. Another one says it's good works. 
Another one says it's moral preparation. Another one says it's Christian principles. The overwhelming favorite is the Holy Spirit. The idea that because in Scripture sometimes oil is associated with anointing or with the coming of the Holy Spirit upon someone, that that must be what he's talking about here. Which when you interpret the Bible, you do certainly want to see how a phrase or a concept is used elsewhere in the Bible. But just because one uses it in one place doesn't mean another is using it the same way in another place. I think the best answer probably comes from Martin Luther, who said that it is faith. After all, if it is the thing on which your eternity hinges, whether you will be entering into heaven or not entering into heaven, then what else could it be but faith? Since scripture teaches elsewhere that that is what's required to get into heaven. First, faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done and in the promises of, of God. But you can see by the wide diversity of answers to that, that it's not really clear in this text exactly what the oil is. So if the point of the text is to say, you need to get more oil, then why doesn't he tell us what we need more of, what this oil is? But the third reason why I don't think that's the thrust of it has to do with something in the text itself. When I read a lot of the sermons about this passage, it's almost as if many pastors preach on verses 1 through 12. And they don't mention anything about verse 13. But look very carefully at verse 13. Because this parable, like many parables, Jesus uses to tell us what the final point of the parable is. So at the end of the parable of the ten virgins, what is the point? Jesus says in verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This, these three parables in chapter 25 are all of a piece with what is in Matthew chapter 24. Now we didn't get to go through Matthew chapter 24 together. I wish we had. It has to do with the end of time, with what God is going to do when Christ returns. And it's fascinating, the discussion over chapter 24 about this uh, paradox or contrast of the imminent return of Christ, that Christ could return any second, as opposed to the idea that Christ might be delayed. It might take a while for him to get back. There's a lot of discussion about that. But if you look at chapter 24, all the discussion that Jesus is making there is being made to his disciples. It says he took his disciples aside. It even uses the word privately. And there are no other breaks from 24 to these, these parables in 25. In other words, this story was not intended for the masses. Get more oil. Be better stewards of your talents. No, no, no. These, these stories were intended for the disciples. The disciples. And so the message here is that Christ might be delayed. The bridegroom might not come back right away. You can picture, perhaps, this ancient setting using a little bit of extra biblical evidence uh, to, to create maybe something that fills in the, 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 the portrait for us. Imagine a setting where you had to negotiate for your bride, right? You want to marry a girl? Well, you have to go talk to her father. And you have to come up with a deal. You've got to tell him how many goats and sheep you're going to give him in order to be able to marry his daughter. So the bridal party is ready. They're all gathered together. And finally the deal is struck. And the bridegroom is coming back now to claim his bride. That's why they're all out there waiting at midnight. And Jesus is saying, this might be a while. But the bridegroom is coming. So watch, therefore, for you don't know the day or the hour. When you're going through struggles in your life, when life is hard, when life is unbearable, when the weight that is on your life and on your shoulders seems more than you can bear, don't give up hope. Don't quit. Don't become discouraged. He's coming back. When it looks like evil in the world has gained the ascendancy and things are getting worse and worse, 
Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. He is coming back. There's the gospel, brothers and sisters. The same Christ that brought you to the Father in your baptism, that redeemed your sins, has promised also to come back for you. And he will keep his promise. Amen. Would you please join me now in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please rise. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.